number of you have heard this before. But I wanted to say it because of those who have never heard it. And it's good to hear it again. And it's good to hear it again. Turn, <coughs> turn to Daniel 2, 14. Daniel 2, 34 and 35. Sorry. Daniel 2, 34 and 35. We're not sharing on Daniel, I can assure you. <laughs> 34 and 35. Richard, please. Daniel 2, 34 and 35. And I saw this till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and break them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces all together, and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Okay. Father, we do ask, Lord, that you would open our eyes and our ears, that we may hear your word and understand. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The parables of Matthew 13 are normally taught in the context of Daniel 2, 34 and 35. That the church will grow and continue to grow until it takes over the, the whole earth. The modern kingdom now theology is based on that. But the fact is, the church may grow. We may see that it grows. But how much of that church is actually saved? Now, several weeks ago, we did Call Chosen and Faithful. And I want to continue that with the idea, shall we say, of Matthew 13. How many parables are there in Matthew 13? Seven. Seven. There are seven parables. Seven is the number of perfection or God's uh, uh, number. So we can say that in those seven parables is the complete parable, parables of the kingdom. They're called the parables of the kingdom. Of course, when we look at the parables, we understand that people have taken them and have used them one at a time. But I want us to look at all seven. That's why we're going to take a long time. In other words, we want to say this. One parable cannot argue with another parable. They must all say the same, basically. Just a different facet of the same truth. And therefore, we can't turn around and say, well, this one means that, and that one means that, and so on and so forth. When we look at the parable of the merchantman and the pearl of great price, and uh, the mustard seed, and the woman with the three measures of meal, normally they are spoken of as the woman mixes the three measures of meal and it grows. And this is the gospel being mixed with the world and it will grow and cover the whole earth. As a matter of interest, 
Who is the merchant man? <coughs> Who is the merchant man? We'll come to that just now. Don't worry about it. We'll come to that just now. The first thing to ask is, why does the Lord speak in parables? Because only God the Holy Spirit can understand it. Most people say it's because he was making it simple for people to hear or simple for them to understand. Matthew 13, 10 and 11. Please, Sandra. Matthew 13, 10 and 11. And there. And the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? He answered and said to them, Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. It is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. A mystery is something which was concealed but is now revealed. It's previously been hidden but has now been made clear. So no mystery remains for anyone who will accept the truth. Verse 12, please, Ross. For whoever has to him more will, will be given, and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Another translation of that says... Even that he seemeth to have. True believers and ardent seekers strain to increase in knowledge, but unbelievers and casual inquirers go into more ignorance and darkness. Verse 13, please, Max. Therefore, I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Now, we must understand, parables were in use by a lot of Jewish teachers, and they still are today. But as the hidden things in natural, which are only revealed upon deeper examination, so too there are hidden things in the parables. When you hear it, there's a surface meaning. But as you meditate on it, there's a deeper meaning, and a deeper meaning. It's like the, the, the skin of an onion. You peel it off, and there's another layer under, un, underneath, and you peel it off, and, and so on and so forth, until you get to the heart of the matter. <coughs> Thus, the parables are easy to understand on the surface, take some work and study to understand partly what is meant, but take total application and meditation to fully understand all that is meant. In other words, many see the surface meaning, but do not see the deeper meaning. Mm. That is, they hear the story, they accept the story, but do not ask what it is the true meaning of the story. Verse 14. Please, Rosie, would you? In that case, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled, which says, <clears throat> You will keep on hearing, but you will not understand. You will keep on seeing, but you will not perceive. In the original Greek, it actually says, To them is fulfilled again. To them is fulfilled again the prophecy of Isaiah. As their ancestors did not want to understand the prophet's warnings because it disturbed them so much. So these people who were listening to Jesus were no different. <coughs> Verse 15, please. Neville. For, their, for the hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing and their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, 
lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. Okay, so, so Jesus is saying these people have become satisfied with their traditions and do not want to change. Satan and all his demons can't nullify the word of God. Mark 7, 13. Mark 7, 13. Making the word of God of no effect through your tradition, which you have handed down, and many such things you do. It's very interesting because <coughs> the, the old King James says, Thus you nullify the word of God by your tra 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 tradition. Note, Satan and his demons can't nullify the word of God. No. But you can nullify it by your tradition. Their religion is sufficient to solve their consciences without being too strenuous and they have n no real wish to change. Most people today have a religion which solves their conscience. They don't want to change. They're quite happy with what they've got. And the third thing that he's saying is but true seeing and true hearing brings healing in every area of our lives. Mm -hmm. Matthew 13, 16 and 17, <coughs> please. Hazel, would you read that for us? Matthew 13, 16 and 17. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For as you, for as you, to me, for they see that many prophets and righteous men desire to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. So let's have a look at the parables now. And so going back to Matthew 13, 3, there are seven parables, we've said that. Okay. The sower, the seed, and the soil. Well, in Matthew 13, 3, right through to 9. Please, Andy. 13, 3 to 9. <clears throat> then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow, and he sowed some, and he, and as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places, where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the sp thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on the good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And then Jesus explained the meaning of the parable. There are four different soils marked here. We've got four soils. The wayside. The stony ground. The rocky ground, isn't it? Or the hard ground, the, uh, the rocky ground. Is everybody happy? And for the good ground. The thorny ground, is it? The, 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 the thorny ground. Mm -hmm. Sorry. <coughs> thorny ground. What I want you to see is the sower goes out to see, to, to, to sow his seed, and he casts the seed. What they used to do was uh, they used to have a, a basket 
which they would tie around their waist, full of seed. And they used to take the seed and cast it as they walked. Mm. And uh, this was the way of, of sowing seed. Therefore, what we've got to understand is, some fell on the wayside. The wayside is hard. And we understand the birds of the air come and pick up seed. So they can't go in. The birds of the air are evil. evil. The birds of the air are evil. Okay. And so that they can't go in. So that one comes to nothing. Then the stony ground, they shoot up, they're full of life, but then the sun comes out and burns them. And they have no root. And the worries of this life cause them to fall away. So that one. Then the thorny ground. The thorny ground is... Well, it, it's got to be good, but the thorns are, 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 are growing. But they grow and they choke the seed. And uh, the problems come and they produce nothing. But this is produces 30, 60 and 100. This is the only ground that produces anything. Briefly, 25% of your ground produces something. 75% produces nothing. That's quite a bad, that's quite, quite a bad um, idea, isn't it? The next parable we come to is the wheat and the tares. Matthew 13, 24 to 30. Matthew 13, 24 to 30. Gina, please. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men sleep, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to them, Do you want us then to go and gather them up. But he said, No, lest while you gather up tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let what grow together until the harvest, and at the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, First gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my, into my barn. Okay. Tears. What's peculiar about the tears? They look like the wheat. They're called bastard wheat. Why are they called that? They like because they look exactly like the wheat, <coughs> except they produce no fruit. And so we understand in the explanation which Jesus then gives, which is from verse 36 
to verse 43, he says, The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. The tares are the children of the wicked one. But we can't tell the difference between the tares and the wicked. So we look at the, the, the world and we say, look at the number of Christians there are. Phenomenal. Great number. There's only one problem. Hmm. There's at least 50% tears amongst them. Mm -hmm. Which look exactly like the wheat. But they don't produce any fruit. And the servant says, shall I go out? and tear up the, wheat, the, the, the tares, pull them up, and burn them. He says, no. Leave it until the consummation of the age. Leave it until the end. Until they're ripe. And then we'll harvest, and the wheat will gather into the barns, and the tares will be burned. In other words, leave the church as it is. With the mixture of tares and wheat. It looks like you've got a big church. But only a portion of it is wheat. The majority of it is tares. And so we go on to the next parable, which is the parable of the mustard seed. Matthew 13, 31 and 32, please, Annie. Matthew 13, 31 and 32. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all the seeds. But when it is grown, it is greater than the herbs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the, the air come and nest in its branches. Now, what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to understand the kingdom, the word of the kingdom, is like a mustard seed. Yeah? It's the smallest of seed. Well, when it's grown, it becomes the greatest of herbs. And becomes a tree. Anyone looked at a mustard bush? A mustard plant? Never could you call it. A mustard plant. It's like mustard in crush in a pot, isn't it? It's very. No, it, it's actually bigger than that, but uh, where they grow it in Israel. Okay. It's bigger than that. But understand, you've got branches. What does it say is nesting in the branches? The birds of the air. But we understood from the first parable that the birds of the air came and took the seed away. They're evil. Michael is mean. So what we what we appear to have is a great big tree. But in fact, only a fraction of it is true. Only a portion of it is true. And so we come to the leaven in the dough. 
you understand that uh, I'm zicking through this because it's a long teaching over several weeks if I go into it every, everything. But I want to get through in just one session. The leaven in the dough, Matthew 13, 33. And it's Martin Peace. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal, till it was all leaven. So, we've got leaven. The woman. <coughs> and three measures of meal. Where do we read about three measures of meal? Do you remember Abraham? The two angels that came to visit oh, yeah. him. And he said, take three measures of meal and bake into cakes to offering to these to the Lord. Yeah. Okay? That's the only other place in the word where you get the three measures of meat. In other words, it's an offering to the Lord. So, we, what we've got is an offering to the Lord, and the woman starts to mix leaven into it. Leaven is yeast. Okay? When you make your bread, you put yeast into it, and then you leave it to rise. And you've got an enormous loaf. But only a little bit of it is dough. Most of it is hot air. Not being funny. But that's most of it. Now we understand there are two types of woman in the Word of God. What are they? The harlot and the faithful. The wife or the bride of Christ and the harlot or the woman called the woman. So she's evil. Leaven. Leaven is sin. Okay. Now, there are five types of sin represented by leaven. They've got five types of sin. Find life. Luke 12, 1, please. Luke 12, 1. Die. And in the meantime, when an innumerable multitude of people have gathered together, so, is that the wrong one? Yeah, yeah. So that they trampled one another, he began to say to his disciples, first of all, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Okay, Matthew 16, 11, please, Sheila. How is it you do not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread, but to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees? What was the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? False religion. Hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. And ritualism. They followed rituals. 
And they looked so great. But they weren't. What did Jesus say? You wear your phylacteries wide and your prayer shawls long. And they stood on street corners offering these great prayers so that they might, might be seen by men. So the one type of leaven is Phariseeism. The second one, believe it or not, is Sadduceeism. I know, everyone knows, they were, they didn't believe in eternal life, that's why they were Sadducees. <laughs> but apart from that, Matthew 16, 12, please, Richard, Matthew 16, 12. Then understood they how that he bade them not to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. The Sadducees were equivalent of the modern day liberal thinker. They rationalized everything. If they could not understand a doctrine, they said it must be wrong. Today, there are many who do the, exactly the same. An example might be the Jehovah's Witnesses who say that because we cannot understand the Trinity, it must be untrue. The third type of is Herodianism. From Herod, Herodianism. Matthew, Mark 8.15, sorry, Mark 8.15. <clears throat> then he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And the leaven of Herod. What was Herod into? He believed that you should be rich. The modern prosperity preachers, the health and wealth fellowships, the emergent church, the purpose-driven church, and the seeker-friendly churches are all into Herodianism. The fourth type is Corinthianism. Corinthians 5, 6, 7 and 8. 1 Corinthians 5, 6, 7 and 8. Not chapters, <coughs> just verses 6, 7 and 8. 1 Corinthians 5, verses 6, 7 and 8. Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Corinthianism, malice and wickedness. And number five, Galatianism. Which everyone should know as legalism. 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 Galatians 5, 1. Galatians 5, 1. 
Where are we up to? Please. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Galatians 5, 7 uh, to 9. Andy. 5, 7 to 9. Yeah. You ran well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion does not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. There are lots of fellowships today that are into legalism. They claim that we must keep the law. And forget that there is none who can truly keep the law. Jesus demonstrated this fully in the Sermon on the Mount where he showed that even if you have considered the sin, You've committed it. And so we cannot keep the law. Now we've said that the woman is evil. And she's mixing leaven, and we've seen the five types of leaven. She's mixing it into the church. So it appears like we've got a big church. Mm. But in fact, there's only a portion of it that's correct. <coughs> the treasure in the field. Matthew 13... 44. Where are we up to? Rosie. Matthew 13, 44. treasure hidden in the field which a man found and hid again and from joy and from joy over it he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field now we must ask ourselves who is the man righteous, no not one there is none who understands there is none who seeks after God. So we understand from scripture that there is none righteous, no not one and there is none who seek after God so it can't be us <laughs> but we understand that also from scripture Luke 19.10 Please, Diana. Luke 19.10. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Mm -hmm. Therefore, if we say explanation A, when a man finds the kingdom of heaven, he's willing to give up everything to possess it, we must be wrong. However, if we take Jesus to be the man, we say that the second explanation, we, we see that the second explanation makes more sense. Jesus died for the true church. That is the treasure hidden in the field. It is Jesus who hides the treasure. 
Have you thought about the size of the treasure to the size of the field? About 25%. Not even. Not even. Not even. Let's go on to the Pearl of Great Price. Matthew 13, 45 and 46. Matthew 13, 45 and 46. Once again, we cannot claim to be the merchant man, for we've already proved from Scripture that we do not seek the Lord. Mm. There is only one person who, when he finds the pearl of great price, is willing to give up everything to possess it. <clears throat> and that's Jesus who gave up everything to possess the pearl of great price please note there are many pearls there are many pearls Number seven, the catch of fish. Matthew 13, 47 and 48. Where are we up to? We've gone to the you, Diana. No? No, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's, not, it's you, Andy. It was, uh, come yeah, up. I'm happy to do it. 47, 47, <laughs> 47 and 48. <laughs> Matthew 13, uh, 47 and 48. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore and they sat down and gathered the good into the vessels, but threw the bad away. Now understand, when I cast a net into the sea, it doesn't catch all the fish in the sea. Yeah. It only catches so many fish. And I drag it to shore and I sit down and I sort out the fish that are worth it and the fish that are not worth it. That one's good. That one's bad. That's useless. That one's good. That's useless. And so on and so forth. Matthew 13, 49 and 50. Gina. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth, separate the wicked from among the just, and cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be a willing and gnashing of teeth. We understand, therefore, Matthew 22, 14, for many are called. Few are chosen. Mm. And even fewer are called chosen and faithful. The good are kept and the bad are thrown away. One of the things we must understand is, is as we look at the church, I do not know whether you are saved. You don't know, know whether I am saved. It's not given to us to know. Each person must make the decision for himself how he serves the Lord. But we don't know how many are wheat and how many are tears. Only you know that for 
each one you know whether you are accepted by the Lord or whether you're just playing at it. Just putting a, a front, front on, a face. Understand that there'll come a time when we all stand in front of the Lord. How terrible it will be if the Lord should say Matthew 7 22 and 23 Please understand, it's not how many miracles are done under our ministry. It's not how many demons we cast out under our ministry. It's how dedicated we are. church is far smaller than what you think. Father, we do ask, Lord, that you would open our eyes and our ears that we may hear and understand. In Jesus' name.